Hello, I'm Ann Bocock and welcome to Between the Covers, presented by WXEL Television and Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore in Delray Beach. Best-selling author Philip Margolin grew up in New York City and Levittown, New York. After college, he spent two years in the Peace Corps in Liberia, West Africa. He then came back to the States and taught junior high during the day and then went to NYU Law School in the evening. His extensive background, which includes 25 plus years as a criminal defense attorney, gives his books a unique inside view of the legal system. And to date, there are 18, plus the new one, 19, Philip Margolin novels. The latest book is Woman with a Gun. It is my pleasure to introduce Philip Margolin. Welcome to Between the Covers. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. The whole thing about not judging a book by its cover, where we're <laughs> throwing that right out the window <laughs> for this one. I'm going to do something I've never done before, and that's start talking about the cover of the book. If you look at the cover, if you saw this in a bookstore, it's like a magnet. You're drawn right to this picture. It's a black and white photograph of a woman, you see her from behind, she's at the, the edge of an ocean and she is wearing what appears to be a wedding gown. You see her full length from the back. You also see that her hands are behind her back and she's holding a gun. So already, before you even open the book, you want to know what this picture is. Where did you find this <laughs> picture? I love telling this story because uh, people are always asking me, where do you get your ideas from? And this is really an easy uh, one to answer. I was in uh, St. Simon Island uh, keynoting a writer's conference. And they have a swanky area called The Village where they have boutiques and art galleries and restaurants. And I was having breakfast at Palmer's Village Cafe. And after I ate breakfast, I went to the bathroom to wash up and over the toilet, it was the most amazing <laughs> photograph I have ever seen. The actual photograph is the one on the cover. So I, you know, I looked at this photograph and I said, well, what the hell is going on here? Did this woman kill her husband on her wedding night? Is she, is she going to commit suicide? Is she waiting for someone to come in from the ocean? She's going to shoot. So I ran out. I washed my hands first, but I ran out. <laughs> And I went up to the cashier and I said, I gotta buy that photograph. So he had to call Leslie Jeter, who's the photographer, and ask her, you know, if it was okay. And then I uh, said, come back the next morning. So I did and I bought it. And at that point I had the name of my next book, Woman with a Gun and the cover. I didn't have any story, it took me a while <laughs> to get that. But uh, that's, you know, so my advice of anyone who wants to write a novel is to go to a lot of toilets and hopefully. <laughs> You, you knew immediately this would be a story. Oh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was saying, what is this, what is this? So yeah, I was, I was just absolutely fascinated. And uh, you know, that's how I usually get my ideas. I'll have uh, some little thing will just you know, get my brain going. And, and this one was like a big thing, so. Well, I'll tell you, I know zero about guns. But I knew that when I, after I looked at this picture, I knew there was something off because of the gun. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, and actually, and I was actually wrong about this. I, have a, I don't know a lot about guns, but I have a, a friend that I always consult. He's no, Steve Perry is another writer, and he's, he knows a lot about guns. So I thought, though, uh, that this was a Western six-shooter like White Earp might have used at the, you know, OK Corral shootout. And actually, in the book, it is. I, I made it there. It turns out it's not. It's, it's uh, so I think it's a Ruger or something like that. But it was the gun that made the photograph. And if it had been, you know, some other kind of gun, you know, a snub nose gun or, you know, some other modern gun, I don't think it would have been that interesting. But it, this, this gun looks like an old Western six shooter. So that, I think, is what tipped the whole thing uh, and made it just so fascinating. You know, the fact not only that she had a gun, but that it appears to be a sort of odd gun. You were a criminal defense attorney. Mm -hmm. You argued uh, many, many murder trials. 
Did you argue before the Supreme Court as well, am I correct? Yeah, I, got, I did 30 murder cases. I, not all of them went to trial, but I did a lot of death penalty cases, and then I did get to argue in the U.S. Supreme Court, and about a quarter, I love appellate law, so a quarter of my practice was appeals, and I did a lot in the Oregon Supreme Court and uh, Federal uh, uh, Ninth Circuit, so uh, that's, I loved it. It was really a lot of fun. So. Were you writing during this 25-year period of being an attorney as well? Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've had a, I had a weird writing career. Uh, I, I never, ever thought about writing as a career. I, was, I, really? I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer and do murder cases since I was 12. Um, and I have been a voracious reader since uh, like early in elementary school. I started reading a couple books a week. So I was in awe of writers and never even occurred to me that I could do it. Um, didn't take it up until my last semester in law school when I, I, I wrote my first novel because I couldn't figure out how anyone could write more than 25 pages. That was the, the only reason I did it. I didn't even think about getting published. Um, I got a lucky break in, in my 30s and my third attempt at writing a novel got published in 1978, so I was 34. That, and then I, I wrote my second book, The Last Innocent Man, in 1981, and then I stopped for 12 years. And the reason I did that is the same year I got my first book published is the year I argued at the U.S. Supreme Court. And in between the two books, I started doing all these big murder cases and big appeals, all the stuff I wanted to do since I was a kid. So I put the writing on the back burner. Um, in 1992, I got the idea for a third book at a dinner party. I just thought it'd be sort of fun to get a third book published. And that became like this huge international bestseller. It was on the Times list for 10 weeks, which was really weird because I didn't think it was, you know, I didn't see it as a best-selling book. So then I thought, well, I, I didn't know if I liked being a full-time writer, and I also didn't know if I'd be a one-hit wonder. You know, you had this one big book, and then you quit practicing, and then you starve to death because your next book doesn't do so good. So uh, I, I stopped taking cases um, and spent, you know, as the caseload went down, my writing went up. And after two years, I, I I'd had five New York Times bestsellers and because I, I, they reissued my old books. And uh, I realized I really did like it, and I, I was a lawyer for 25 years and had a great time. I mean, I, I always say that because people say, oh, I bet you were glad you got out of that law business. I love being a lawyer. But it's, it was nice to have a new job after 25 years, so I switched over and uh, been doing that ever since. Not only a new job, but a very successful new job. Your books are based in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. which is interesting, the Portland area spe specifically, a far cry from where you grew up. Yeah, and I, I, what happened was when uh, I, I grew up on the East Coast in, in Manhattan and Long Island, Levittown, and uh, went to school, undergraduate American in D.C., so I'd never been off the East Coast. Uh, when I went to the Peace Corps, we did, we did our training. I went to Liberia, West Africa, and for some bizarre reason, they did our training in San Francisco, which is, you know, like <laughs> training for the moon by sending someone into the ocean. But was, anyway... But I fell in love with San Francisco and decided I would, I would go back east for law school if, uh, when, I, when I came back from Africa, but uh, we'd get the hell out as quick as I could. And I got my first job was uh, clerking for the chief judge of the Oregon Court of Appeals and never been to Oregon. I, didn't, I had to look it up on a map to find out where it was. <laughs> Uh, I would think a lot of people from Manhattan probably oh, yeah. would have to look it up on a map. And especially this was in the you know or, or late 60s, or early 70s, people wouldn't go out there as much. And then got there and just fell in love with the place and never went back. So uh, that's why I, you know, I love Portland, I love Oregon, that's why I set the books there. I, I can see it in your books. The landscape is very important. It becomes a character mm -hmm. in your novels. And the rain. What's what's cool is you know it rain. It's we have the best summers anywhere in the universe, but we also have rain from almost every day from November all the way through to March. So when I say it was a dark and stormy night, I'm not lying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I could set. It's always gloomy and rainy during that time. So it's really cool if you're writing murder mysteries. You have an edge as an author because of the legal background, wouldn't you say? Yeah, not always the way people think. Um, 
the, you know, every I've done 30 homicide cases, so people think I have 30 novels. And the most, unlike TV, most real murder cases are not mysteries, and there's no romantic interest or anything. Guy goes in a bar, drinks too much, gets into an argument, and stabs someone, then he feels bad the next day and confesses, and you know that's not an edge of your seat story. Um, the advantage is twofold. One, in that when I write a scene where someone's in a contact visiting room up at the jail with someone charged with murder, or when I'm doing a scene in a book for a, a death penalty murder trial, I've actually done this stuff, so I don't have to do research. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I can just you know try to remember what happened, and so I have the language correct, I have the descriptions and stuff, so that's one. And the other thing is being a lawyer is a fabulous training for, for writing because uh, for the editing part because you're trained to be very objective and unemotional about your work. And if you want to be a good writer, you can't have any ego involvement whatsoever. You've got to be able to accept criticism about what you're doing from an editor. And you've got to be objective yourself. You can't fall in love with your words. So as an attorney, you you're never get emotionally involved. And as a writer, you shouldn't get emotionally involved in your stuff. And it's really good for me to read the, something I wrote and thought was brilliant and then the next day come back and say, ugh, this is really not very good. And uh, that, that aspect's very, very useful. There has to be one book you were emotionally involved in, and that's what you wrote with your daughter. Oh. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> you did a children's mystery, Vanishing yeah. Acts. First of all, what was it like at that point to write a children's book? And secondly, with your daughter. Yeah, that's the most fun I've ever had. I have two kids. My daughter's 36 and, and very accomplished. My son's 39 and very accomplished and stuff. But uh, the, an editor at, 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 in the children's division of Harper Collins asked my adult editor if I'd be interested in doing a uh, uh, young adult at that point. It turned out to be 8 to 12 year old. And I mentioned it to my daughter because I wasn't sure I wanted to do it, or if I could. I mean, I'd never written for you know, you know kids that that age, and uh, she got real excited. She said, "Let's do it together." So uh, I said, "Okay, but you're going to do all the work," which is why you have kids anyway. So <laughs> you used to be that when you had the farm, you know, they, you had a ton of kids, so they could go out and do all the work, and you could drink hard cider on the porch. And, so, but this, I said, if I'm going to do it, I said, well, brainstorm stuff, but then you're going to, and I actually wanted her to get the, learn how to write a book. So, but it was great. We get along great, and neither one of us, you know, has a big ego, so we were able to really work well together, and it was just the most fun I've ever had. I, I really enjoyed it. It was fun because you were with your daughter? Yeah, yeah, that was the whole thing. Just doing a project with her was, was, was Well, you me. know, kids are really tough to impress. <laughs> so I would think that this would not be such a piece of cake, uh, writing my this My kids book. are totally unimpressed with me. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, all, they're both smarter than I am and much more accomplished, and, and uh, they've, they've never taken me very seriously ever. So, uh, Well, I, I applaud you for writing, for doing the children's book, because it, how important is it for, to get kids to read something, yeah. anything? They have so many distractions. Growing up... Books were like my oxygen, mm -hmm. but I did not have the distractions that yeah, teens I'm, have today. I'm really heavily involved with the Chess for Success program. Uh, I was one of the founders in 92. We used chess to uh, uh, trick kids into learning study skills. And one of the great things about playing chess is it's not a video game. That you have, actually have to in, interact with another human being. So uh, we're in like 76. Title I elementary schools in, in all over the uh, 19, I think it's 19 school districts in Oregon. But that's one of the best things about getting kids involved with chess is that they can't, uh, you know, it's not, they have to be with a person and it's, they're not in front of a monitor and uh, gets them out of the house and that sort of thing. So, Did this come out of what you did when you taught junior high school? Is, is this where you... Where the chess you, program? The chess program. No, I was... Uh, <laughs> I was a delinquent. I was, a, I was really a horrible student. I was in all the dummy classes, and uh, uh, I had a short attention span. And for some, the kids in our neighborhood got into. We were doing judo and football, and then we got into chess for some reason. Oh. And I just got fascinated by it. Um, 
and flunked math in the eighth grade. I had to go to summer school, and Dr. Zal, my summer school teacher, saw that I had chess books with me, which I shouldn't have. I should have had math books, but uh, he asked me if I wanted to play after, and, and I was able to beat him about half the time, and another high school teacher all the time. So sort of gave me self-confidence, and if you play chess, you have to sit with your feet on the floor. You have to focus uh -huh. uh, all your attention on the, on the problem, which is what move. You have to take your time. You can't get excited. And uh, by learning how to play chess correctly, I also learned how to be a good student because instead of getting mad when I couldn't do a math problem, throwing a book, which I used to do, I, I realized you know, that chess move took me a long time to figure out. So maybe if I calm down and just relax uh, and go through all the possibilities. So my grades went up and I got out of the dummy classes, but I was still a behavior problem. Uh, well, <laughs> you can't have it all. I'm just, it's just so refreshing for me to hear that you were not the A student all the way through school. Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> you did spend a couple of years in the Peace Corps mm -hmm. in Liberia, yep. West Africa, as, as, as you said. These were the days where idealistic young people were sent into the villages to help the less fortunate. What did you actually do there? Oh, I was in, actually I was in Monrovia. Uh, they had a special public administration project. Um, I worked in the Liberian government. I was an administrative assistant to the Liberian director of foreign trade, and then I was a, a transport economist with the Harvard Advisory Group and the National Pla Planning Agency. And if there are anyone here who was in the Peace Corps knows that those titles are much more grandiose than what I actually did. So, but it was it was a fantastic experience, and uh, just uh, I think the it was much more valuable than any uh, school I ever went to. Because you get to live in a country that doesn't, where people don't think the way they do in America, you learn that mm -hmm. it's not necessarily bad. You know, people can can look at things differently, and have a different type of culture, and that doesn't mean that they're it's it's bad or evil or anything. And then I got a phenomenal opportunity to travel, which back in the '60s a lot of people didn't do. So I was all nice. through the Middle East and Russia and all over the place uh, on the government dime, which was, you know, it was really, I couldn't have afforded to do it. I didn't have a lot of money. So uh, it was, I, usually if you ask Peace Corps, uh, people in Peace Corps say best two year, years of their lives. And, and I think that it was certainly most exciting. My daughter went in the Peace so Corps. So you also. certainly supported her wanting to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> I was like telling this there, that my, my mom was one of those people who would, would not come right out and say she didn't want me to do something. So. Uh, my last semester in, in uh, college, I get a letter from her, you know, this is after I've been accepted to go to Africa and Liberia, which is the West Coast, and she says, uh, you know, how's school, how's everything going, and then included in the letter was an article from the New York Times about nuns being slaughtered in the Congo. <laughs> so I call her up, I said, I said, Mom, I said, you know, if you don't, we could always talk to each other. If you don't want me to go in the Peace Corps, tell me. I said, I'm going to go anyway, but you can always be honest with me. He said, no, I just wanted you to know what was going on. I said, well, I said, uh, telling someone about nuns being slaughtered in the Congo when they're going, going to West Africa and Liberia, it's like telling someone someone got shot in New York when they're going to L.A., you know. But I think she thought that Africa was like a block. Long, <laughs> this was like small area or something. You've had some of your work adapted for TV and for film. Is, is this tricky for a writer? Because you, you've already written this. You know, you've edited it. It is the way you want it. Yeah, yeah actually, uh, uh, I, I, I was lucky in that b both, I've had two um, books made in movies. Last Instance of Man was HBO. Uh, Ed Harris starred in it. And then I had a miniseries, uh, Gone But Not Forgotten, with Brooke Shields. Mm -hmm. And both were, were good. One, uh, Last Night Man was f fantastic and got a lot of award nominations. And the other one, I thought, was really good, solid. So that didn't bother me. But actually, when I, my books are projects, like uh, crossword puzzles. And once I'm done with them, I, you know, I sometimes forget who the characters are and what the plot was. I mean, I'll reread it for some reason years later. Oh, did I write that? That's interesting. <laughs> so, so uh, so I found it interesting to see what someone else would do with uh -huh. my work. And I had about half the half my books have been optioned for the movie. So uh, two got made, but I got to see screenplays for a number of other ones. And 
I, I, I just find it interesting to see what someone else someone else's take on, on what I do. I've never heard an author say that before. Mm -hmm. they, they're usually very you know, much close to the vest and they don't like when the changes are made. Would well, you, oh, go, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but I got really friendly with the uh, producer um, of, of uh, the first book, Last Instant Man. He didn't like having uh, authors on the set. He says mm -hmm. they go nuts if you change a word. And I said, listen, why don't you give me the check? You can put mutants and spaceships in. I don't care. <laughs> so they said, oh, I like you. So I got a part in the movie and got to listen to sound equipment and go to dailies. And That's fun. It was great. Yeah, it was great. It was really interesting. Uh, what about dialogue? As a reader, I have to have the dialogue to be realistic and not forced. What's easier for you, writing the, the, the words that are coming out of someone's mouth or, or the plot? Well, I'm a plot guy. I mean, both are okay. Uh, I'm a plot guy. I'm really, uh, actually, my weakness is in character development. I really have to work hard at that plot. I don't think I've ever had an editor or, or hardly any reviewer criticize the plot. I do get slammed. Be, you know, my brother and I had a joke. We'd, we, <clears throat> we'd, you'd read this review, and it would say, great plot, really fabulous, terrific. And then there would always be a sense, but Margolin's characters are one-dimensional. And we would just laugh about it because it was like every... So I have to work really hard. I think after about 19 books, I'm starting to get to the point where... Yeah. They don't say that in the reviews. I which think really you might have that now. It wasn't easy, though. Uh, but the dialogue, the way you do the dialogue is I just talk to myself. And so uh, what I do is I, you, here's a trick. So you write, you write the dialogue out. Then you read it out loud. And we don't speak the way we write. Uh, you, you don't normally say, I do not like that. You say, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And... When we speak, we break things up, and it's not in, in complete order. You're just trying to communicate some idea. I mean, for me, one of the most embarrassing things is to read a transcript of one of my trials. Because when I was doing the trial, I thought I sounded like, you know, the most brilliant orator who ever lived. <laughs> and then you read it, oh, my God, I sound like a moron. So, <laughs> so reading, reading the stuff out loud it will let you hear the clunkers. And what I do is I just talk to myself back and forth. Dialogue's tough because it's got to be logical. If someone A says something, the response by B's got to make a lot of sense. And uh, so... Uh, I, I don't find it tough to write dialogue, but it, it requires a certain amount of work. Something that was tricky in this book, Woman with a Gun, which I loved, was that it was a story within a story. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to do that well or it doesn't work. Yeah, I like, for me, I, I'm more of a, a fan than I am a writer. I love, and I love writing books that usually have, if they have two or three stories in them that don't appear to have any connection whatsoever. You say, well, why, why, why are they talking about this? What does this have to do with anything? And then they come together. So um, I like to write books like that, where it's not necessarily apparent right away what's going on, and then slowly but surely you figure out, oh, they are all connected up. Oh, no, that, that's so true, because as a defense attorney, it's your duty to defend this person, whether they're guilty or, or not mm -hmm. guilty. In as a novelist, I'm hooked because I'm not so sure if this person <laughs> is guilty or not guilty and who is the guilty person. So that I, I applaud you for. I, I love well, that in your books. That's my job. <laughs> it's supposed to confuse you so you'll like the book. So. Uh, tell me, how long does it take you to write a book? How long did this one take? Well, I mean, usually um, about a year and a half. Um, the, the hard part for me is getting an idea, because idea is this big and a book's this big, so getting an idea that's big enough to fill up you know, 400 pages, that's the hard part. Uh, the writing for me has never been that tough, but getting a complex idea that's, that will make an interesting story, that's, that's hard. Once I get the idea, um, I figure out the ending, and I won't write a word till I know the ending, because the ending's the most important part of a book. If you read a book, uh, well, how many of you guys have read a book uh, or, or seen a movie that was really good but had a dumb ending? Yeah. So what do you tell your friend? Eh, you know, I just saw that movie. It was, it was so stupid at the end. 
you forget you loved most of it, but the ending leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Flip that over. How many of you have read a book or seen a movie that was okay, but it had a fabulous ending? What do you tell you? Oh, my God. I just, when I found out who the killer was, my jaw dropped. You forget most of the book really wasn't that good. So I won't yeah. write a word, literally won't write a word until I've got um, the ending. I can change it because it's my book, but I have to know a roadmap. Where am I going? And then once I've been thinking, and I, I've actually thought about executive privilege, took me 10 years between getting the idea and writing it, and Worthy Brown's Daughter, which was the, the book I wrote before, before that, yeah, which is a historical novel. I started that in 1983. So I'm not lying when I say sometimes it takes me a long time to work the idea into a, a book. But once I've got been thinking about it and I'm comfortable with the characters and the setting and I know the ending, I do a very extensive outline, which takes one to three months, uh, and I literally talk my way through the book from beginning to end. And then once, I've, once I have the outline done, it's a snap. I just take each paragraph, turn it into a chapter. It's not very good. It's, it's a, I think of it as a 400-page outline. And then I spent months on quality. So usually the hard part is how long it takes me to figure out the ending and the idea. Once I got that... It's about one to three months on the outline, and then um, another maybe six to eight months writing the draft and then doing the editing process. All right. Well, this one, Woman with a Gun, we know that after talking to you that there's already another one percolating inside of your head, so we'll be waiting for that one as well. I want to thank you so much for being here. Oh, this yeah. has been such a pleasure. My guest has been Philip Margolin. His latest book is Woman with a Gun, You'll notice the black and white picture. Pick it up, read it. It's fabulous. This is Between the Covers. I want to thank you all for watching. I'm Ann Bocock. Until next time, thank you. Thank you.